Thanks to everyone for coming along here today. It's a really good opportunity and I'd like to give my course acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, um, pay my respects to their elders past and present. Uh, but I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Daniel Watt and organising today for inviting me along. It's, um, it's a really good forum that you've put together and uh, to be honest, it's the first time, despite having been a long time Republican advocate myself, I've never had, actually had to turn my mind to coming up with a new sort of model and I really thank you for providing me with the opportunity and the time pressure to come up with something and uh, I think I've come up with a decent model, uh, if I could say so myself, so <laughs> thanks for having me along. Um, my vision for Australia is an Australia that is the engine room of the Asian century. Better engaged economically and socially with Asia and the world, a more cohesive and pluralistic nation with stronger institutions and safety nets, all of which are underpinned by a mature and ambitious national identity, an Australian Republic with opportunity for all. An Australia where any Australian child, including my own, uh, who my wife will be giving birth to in July sometime, uh, would have the opportunity to aspire to become Australia's head of state, and any Australian child for that matter, if they should choose to do so. I firmly believe that Labor should place the Republic back on the agenda and make it central to its narrative and vision for Australia as we head into the next election. Coupled with a strongly supported and robust Republican model that respects the will of the Australian people, I wholeheartedly believe Australia could become a Republic in the near future. But in doing so, I strongly believe that we must learn from the mistakes of 1999. The model I'm proposing today has the potential to possibly act as a ceasefire between the differences that exist within the Republican camp. I believe that we can learn from the strengths and flaws of the two most prominent models, the two-thirds majority minimalist model, model, and the direct election model to formulate a new 50-50 model. The key strengths associated with the two-thirds majority model is that it would not fundamentally change the current nature of Australian politics. An Australian, pre an Australian president would essentially inherit all the existing powers and responsibilities of the existing government general and have no political role that supersedes a prime minister and system of parliamentary government. However, the key flaws of the model uh, of the minimalist model include that the president is elected by two thirds majority of the federal parliament with no public buy-in or influence whatsoever. The key strengths associated with the direct election model are that it is the preferred model by people in the community. And it also caused a split in 1999 um, and led to many people deciding not to vote for a republic as a result. But it does provide the community with a direct say on who should become president, which is what the overwhelming number of people do want. But the weaknesses with this model include that it would fundamentally change the nature of Australian politics by moving us towards a more United States style presidency, where the president would have his or her own mandate which would supersede that of the parliament. My 50 50 model takes from what currently works in our system and what strengths exist within the two prevailing or more prominent systems uh, that have been suggested and creates a compromise model. My model is also based on the following premises that I support and I believe many of you here might support as well. I support the Prime Minister being the head of our government. I support the Cabinet and government being formed by the political party that has the majority in the House of Representatives. I support the current government model where policy, bills and legislation is generated, passed and amended and rejected from the Parliament. However, I do not support Australia moving towards a Republican model where our President is simply a ceremonial figure, but instead a President that would not only inherit in full the current Governor General's powers, but would also have the capacity to act as our nation's social and moral conscience on issues of national importance. My Republican model that I'm putting forward today and seeking your support for is the 50-50 model. The 50-50 model gives every Australian a 50% share of the vote in electing an Australian President. The other 50% of the vote would come from the Australian Parliament. Such a balance, I believe, would ensure the community has a fair say in who our Head of State should be, whilst also ensuring our Parliament is involved to elect the most appropriate candidate to the role, review and ideally support the community's decision. The 50-50 model will give every Australian a say in who becomes the Australian President. Every major poll on the preferred Republican model has consistently shown the community want a say in who their President is. The 50-50 model, whilst not providing the community with a 100% say, will at least provide a 50% more say on who becomes our Head of State than is currently the case. Any future successful Republican model must provide provision for the community to have a say, and I strongly believe this model can provide the right balance. The 50-50 model also allowed the concerns of the political community and the Republican community, many of whom were concerned during the late 1999 Republican debates that the direct model would fundamentally change our political structure. This model would address this concern because the Australian President would essentially be inheriting all the current Governor General's powers as a guardian of our Constitution and still keeping our Prime Minister as our head of government and our Cabinet drawn from, a party, from the party that has the majority in the House of Representatives. 
The Australian Parliament is 50% of the vote on who becomes Australian President. We'll also help ensure that any successful candidate's platform and mandate will be consistent with the requirements and powers under the Constitution. The powers of the President under the 50-50 model will be twofold. First, the President, as I said, will be, will be inheriting all the existing Governor General's powers. But further powers will also be codified and clarified in the Constitution in relation to the existing unqualified, unspecified or reserved powers. However, under my model, the President will also be more than just this ceremonial type figure. My vision is for the Australian President to act as our social and moral conscience. This is because if the powers and responsibilities of an Australian President under a 50-50 model would be simply identical to that of the existing Governor General, where the Governor General has no capacity whatsoever to comment or influence public policy, then the popular, public popular election process for the presidency would simply be a popularity contest without any substance or differentiation amongst the candidates. To be more than just a ceremonial figure and to help add meaning and points of difference to any presidential campaign and candidates, under my model, the scope of an Australian president to comment and help influence good public policy would be specified. Currently, our constitution spells out the areas of public policy that the government can legislate in. And I propose that a new constitution would spell out areas for the president to be able to comment and influence on. Such areas, I believe, should be traditional, non-political and bipartisan areas of policy that could include, for example, foreign affairs, where the president would regularly represent Australia's interests abroad and represent the government of the day's views. Defence, maintaining the governor general's commander in chief roles, as is currently the case, for all our defence forces. However, acting on the advice of the parliament, not just the cabinet, except in roles, of course, of urgent needs of national self-defence. But other bipartisan issues could also include veterans affairs, education, health, environment, human rights, Aboriginal policy, multiculturalism, domestic violence, housing, homelessness, poverty, people with disabilities, carers, young people, women, the arts, tourism, families, older Australians and sport. Having a president with the ability to run for office with a view on some or all of these issues which should be all above political lines and also once in office helps set the tone of public debate and expectation amongst the community and the political parties in Parliament will, I believe, improve the quality and focus of our public debates, policy outcomes and policy consistency. Under this model, the political parties in Parliament will still, of course, have the ability, as they do now, to debate, determine policy issues related to taxation and expenditure, finance, human services, telecommunications, employment, business, industrial relations and the like. However, having an Australian president acting as our nation's moral compass for social conscience will help ensure focus and consistency, consistency over the lifetime of different political parties and government on issues that are close to our nation's heart, soul and community well-being. The now bi bipartisan annual Closing the Gap Progress Report to the Parliament on the first sitting day of each year by the Prime Minister and Opposition Leader is a very good example on how certain issues should be elevated above the daily grind of political debate into long-term view to making genuine progress. Importantly, the President's powers will not allow for the vetoing of bills or legislation that has been passed with the majority of the Parliament and will not allow for the President to supersede the Prime Minister or the High Court in relation to government decisions or legal interpretations respectively, prior to providing the Presidential assent to a bill before it becomes law. The Constitution could allow for the President to review and seek further clarification and information on bills from the Parliament based on a social and moral, moral conscience charter as a means to further encourage the non-partisan issues codified in the Constitution under the President's stewardship continue being progressed. Strict timeframes, of course, around requesting such advice from the Parliament to the relevant parliamentarians providing it should be strictly outlined in the Constitution to ensure it does not prolong the, prolong the delay of the bill becoming law. The President would not have the power to refuse giving a sense of bills based on this charter, but could in providing a sense be permitted to accompany the signed bill with a letter to the Parliament on future considerations on similar debates and issues. Along with specifying the issues the President will be able to comment and influence on, the Constitution will also make provision for the President to give an annual State of the Nation address to a joint sitting of the Parliament. This State of the Nation address will provide the key formal mechanism for the President to relay to parliamentarians the priorities and expectations of the Australian people in relation to non-political issues the Australian Parliament should be seeking to make progress on annually. The 50% public component of the President's vote will help ensure that he or she will be accountable to the public on ensuring that Parliament maintains focus on the key issues whether it's domestic violence or homelessness, poverty, indigenous affairs and the like. The nomination process will also be very new and unique under the 50-50 model. Firstly, any potential presidential candidate will have the ability to organise and build community support, secure a minimum number of signatures from Australians in order to run. The signature threshold will be high enough to prevent undesirable and vexatious candidates from running, 
Yet be low enough to encourage genuine candidates with broad community support and high standing to nominate. Given the 50% public voting component for the presidency, it would be likely that the major political parties would put forward and nominate their preferred candidates based on party lines, which would also help ensure good quality candidates put forward. Following the respective internal pre-selection processes for the main political parties and the formal signature nomination process, the presidential candidate would then formally enter the campaign and election period. The capacity for the presidential office to express views and priorities on key social and national conscious issues would give the campaign significant substance and give the opportunity policy preferences to think about. For example, one candidate may run on the need to bridge the gap with Indigenous Australians, another candidate may run on the need to lift Australians out of poverty, and another candidate may run on the need to address issues of homelessness and housing. This is important because an election process for candidates that would only be inheriting the current dry Governor General's powers would not be of much interest or relevance to many in the community. Giving the presidential candidates the capacity to talk about issues of national importance will capture many in the community's imagination, I believe. At the end of the election process, the Electoral Commission will count the public ballot and declare the victorious two-candidate preferred presidential candidate. This will then be brought to the Parliament during a special joint sitting of the Parliament to elect an Australian President. This special joint sitting will be chaired by the Chief Justice of the High Court and whipped by the Australian Electoral Commissioner so that all parliamentarians, including the Speaker and Senate President, will be able to exercise the balance of the Federal Parliament's 50% of the vote. Each parliamentarian will be given a ballot that is akin to that utilised by the public, so that a leading two-party preferred, a two-candidate preferred uh, person by the parliament can be determined. At the conclusion of the parliamentary vote, the chair and chief justice will instruct the Australian Electoral Commission's appointed returning officer to go away, count the parliament's votes, and weigh that with the public's 50% vote accordingly. Following the count and weighing processes, the result will be given by the Electoral Commission to the High Court's chief justice, who would formally announce. Victorious candidate and results to the Parliament. On the following parliamentary sitting day, the President will be sworn by the Chief Justice, perhaps a week or so later, in the presence of parliamentarians, followed by the capacity to make a State of the Nation address to a joint sitting. The Prime Minister and Leader of the Opposition, of course, will be provided with the opportunities to respond accordingly. My vision under 5050 would be for parliamentarians to support and respect the vote of the preferred candidate of the Australian people. One candidate from the public vote emerges with overwhelming support. It could be argued that parliamentarians, regardless of political persuasion, would be pressured by results in their own electorates to reciprocate that support. However, in a parliament where political lines are as clear as night and day, capacity must also, of course, be allowed for parliamentarians to vote, to, to vote in accordance with their party lines and respect the political parties nominating candidate. If, for example, a Labour president was elected by the people and the Labour Party had the majority in the parliament, it would be a very much a straightforward exercise where the Parliament's majority would just reinforce the public's vote. However, if a Liberal candidate was elected by the popular vote and the Parliament had a Labour majority, the final outcome following the AUC's weighing would be a great deal more interesting and engaging. The 50-50 parliamentary Labour caucus leadership ballot is an interesting case study in this regard. As we all know, the Labour Party changed their voting structures to allow for grassroots members to have a 50% say in the vote who becomes the Federal Caucus Leader. Anthony Albanese won the grassroots membership vote, but the, but the caucus vote was strong enough to elect Bill Shulman as the leader following the way of the, of, the voting, of the votes. Rather than cause instability amongst the grassroots members or the caucus, this inclusive change into the voting structure of how a leader is elected has generated thousands of new members and renewed party interest. It has also actually strengthened the mandate, leadership and position of the leader with virtually no dissent from internal or external ranks since the process was completed. I firmly believe that we can learn from this process and the success of this model and try and apply it to this 50-50 Republican model. Furthermore, the current appointment process for Australian Governor Generals, and for that matter ambassadors, departmental secretaries and the like, is arguably infiltrated with political self-interest and persuasion and does not allow for any public influence. The 50-50 model will fundamentally improve on these current arrangements by at least giving the public a say in who the President becomes or should become. The 50-50 model's provision for a parliamentary say and vote will help alleviate the concerns of the political community, I believe, that a publicly elected president's mandate will supersede that of the Prime Minister and Government. It will also help ensure that the President would have the responsibility to the public and to the Parliament to exercise his or her powers in strict accordance with the Constitution. The Parliament's involvement will also again act as another vetting mechanism to the public signature threshold to ensure inappropriate or vexatious candidates cannot be elected. I believe under this model, Election dates should also be fixed and made clearly separate and embedded in the Constitution between the presidential elections, the Australian parliamentary elections, state elections and council elections. 
This will help ensure the money and issues associated with the respective elections are minimised. Presidential elections should take place, for example, either every six or eight years on a particular fixed date, which doesn't conflict with any other election date. But no president, I believe, should be allowed to serve more than the one term. Having fixed election dates will give the community certainty, business confidence, and discourage double dissolutions or minimise double dissolutions outside of fixed election periods. However, I do acknowledge that no matter how many presidential powers are codified in the Constitution, voting processes solidified and election dates fixed, there may be constitutional parliamentary scenarios the 50-50 model must make provision for. My 50-50 model -50 to make provision for a myriad of these scenarios, which I will elaborate on another occasion, and I will make available online through Daniel White, if you're interested in having a look at those. However, the key improvement I am proposing under the 50-50 model in instances of parliamentary deadlock is a new step called before the parliament can be formally dissolved and an election called, which would be known as a presidential forum. The provision for a new presidential forum phase in the constitution would require a minimum number of delegates from both the House and Chamber and House and Senate to request a forum with the president or the president seek a forum at Government House in Yarralama with the objective to mediate, negotiate and reach a resolution or compromise. The president's social conscience mandate and role as steward of our constitution and parliamentary democracy would be or could be influential in avoiding a constitutional crisis. The public's vote and trustworthiness in the office of the president to rise above politics and reach consensus could also carry significant weight. A prime minister will also not be allowed to be removed from the parliament by a president if he maintained or she maintained the confidence of the House of Representatives, and the Senate will also maintain the, the ability to uh, continue to block supply and block other bills as as it sees fit as well. But again, more details around those will be available online. But in saying that, I also urge the community not to buy into the scare and fear mongering that's peddled by the monarchists as to why we should remain the status quo due to the constitutional uncertainties of any new model. It is utter, that is utter, utter nonsense and rubbish, as the current reserve powers of the Queen and Governor General also do create similar uncertainties. Putting 1975 aside, Australia has managed to run a large and bloodless, persecution averse, and peaceful democratic system with no need for interference from the Queen or Governor General. Having an Australian as our head of state, with responsibilities on behalf of both the public and the parliament, will significantly enhance this system. As we head to the 2016 federal election, in my capacities as the uh, president of the West Coast Gale Fed Branch, delegate to the 20LP State Conference, and member of the Australian Labor Republican Group, I will be advocating that Labor take the next election at clear vision, platform and timeline on how we will achieve an Australian Republic. I will be advocating that Labor should consider adopting a 50-50 model, as I believe it generally has the ability to unite the Republican movement due to its ability to incorporate both the public and the parliament in determining who the president becomes. I strongly urge you to support my 50-50 model uh, with an Australian president as our social conscience and steward of our constitution. It incorporates the public, which is essential in any future Republican model. It incorporates the parliament, which is essential in getting bipartisan political support. And it creates the office of a president with the powers of our current government general does not supersede those of the parliament. Yet with enough capacity and influence to debate or to provide influence on public debate of matters of national importance that should all be above political lines. Thank you again for the opportunity to present the 50-50 model and I hope to get your support uh, later in the day. Thanks again.